bandwidth for this podcast is brought to you by ID8 Software. Be sure to check out all of their great Revit applications designed to increase your productivity. Here we go. We're starting a BIM Thoughts episode. Episode number, Carl insert number here. And we have Peter Marchese. Peter's here with us. Carl is here with us. And Dana DeFilippi is here with us. So, Peter, who the heck are you? Define yourself. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> uh, so, the title I have at Microdesk is Senior Technology Evangelist, which basically I ripped off of. Um... Oh, dear God. Lynn, you, looked, you stole that from Lynn Allen. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it's the weekend, so <laughs> I'm going to be forgetting everyone's names. But the, I grabbed that from her because part of what I been doing at Microsoft for a long time has been focusing all the emerging technologies. I uh, started using Revit in 6.1 and started figuring out, oh. well, using it's one thing. What else can we do with it? How can we bend it without breaking it? And once it breaks, how can we fix it? So I was doing a lot of public speaking and outreach and training and everything. And, you know, I like the title because it is completely cheesy. It's hard to say it with a straight face. So it's mm-hmm. a little bit disarming at a meeting. It's not like, oh, you're this or that. People are always like, well, what the hell does that mean? Which legitimate question. So I can yeah. go in and just talk about a couple of different things. And you know, the main thing with me is I like looking at all the new tools, seeing if they're actually useful. Uh, I enjoy the problem solving. You know, I, I like trying to be stumped. You know, I, I grew up uh-huh. watching MacGyver and A-Team. So I like figuring things out with weird things. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, okay. but unfortunately, belling wire and toothpaste don't work very well on a computer. Uh, no, not really, but the bailing wire is conductive, so if you need to patch something, <laughs> that might help. Here, define yourself a little bit outside of work. Uh, uh, that, that weird guy that's either really quiet or you can't get to shut up. Uh, I really enjoy building things. Uh, I usually try to avoid work stuff outside of work. Uh, I still end up getting asked to fix people's computers or run stuff from the tech side, but I play with my cats. I build things around the house. Uh, I've been really into music the last two years and playing in bands. Uh, I was really hoping that if AU London went off that my session would get accepted because I signed up for a class at a guitar building school in the UK. Since everything kind of got shut down from that, I ended up uh, getting a kit and modifying that. So I have mm-hmm. a, a double neck guitar that I just recently built and played out with uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that was wow. fun. But, That's cool. Uh, wow. so you just need a third hand to, to play it. those. Uh, it, it, you know, it was funny. The, I had the song completely down. It, the, the, I did three songs on that one, and it's a 12 string uh-huh. and a 6 string. And one of them uh-huh. I had to go back and forth relatively quickly. It was uh, Wanted Dead or Alive. Uh-huh. And it, it was a whole other couple of days just getting comfortable, making sure that my hand went from one neck to the other without banging into it. And that uh-huh. I was able to actually hit the switch to turn one neck off and turn the other neck on without, you know, having no oh, sound. Yeah. Or, so never thought of that. I, I didn't either. <laughs> Make it a foot switch. Uh, I, I could, but then I'd need to have some way to change the signal or I need to have two outs. And then I would need an AB switch to control that. And I've seen some guitars that have that. Wow. It's simple physics. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I try to keep my hands in a lot of different things. Uh, well, yeah, uh, two two neck guitar, you got to keep your hands on both necks. Exactly. <laughs> Still do a little Steve Vai, play both at the same time. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I wonder if you could uh, make a uh, a something that would strum the guitar for you. Yeah, you can. So you could actually uh, play both the necks at the same time. They do. Uh, have you ever gone to the maker fairs? I'm surprised. I have not been to a maker's fair. I've been to a online maker fairs but uh, las be... vegas doesn't have a big maker community really well, I yeah i just figured it would have a lot Mm-mm. no southern california is huge yes and the new york city one i i tr- usually travel up there every year just to see what's going on and they uh-huh. usually have a couple of uh, like robotic computer uh, uh driven uh, musical devices like uh-huh. one year they had a drum kit that was being played in it wasn't that it was an electronic drum kit. It was a typical analog one, and the, it was actually swinging the sticks and doing everything there. They had one that was doing guitar. Uh-huh. I think the funniest one I saw was a traditional upright uh, baby grand piano that was modified, and you had to use that to play Street Fighter. Uh-huh. So, like, if you wanted to throw a fireball, you had to, like, do a chord. It was actually uh-huh. hilarious. Well, that'd be fun with the old Nintendo 
fighting mm-hmm. game too, the uppercut, uppercut. <laughs> I don't remember the name. Street we always Fighter? called it uppercut. The Mike Tyson one? The Mike, yeah, I think it was the Mike Tyson one. I don't, I don't <laughs> Punch remember. Out? Punch Out? Is that yes. it? I don't know. We That's always called Tyson it uppercut. One, yeah. yeah, yeah. I wasn't very good at it. And then, um, what's the other one? The uh, the the one that all the cool kids are playing now on the Mortal on Kombat the Nintendo. No, not oh, Mortal not on Kombat. Uh, Smash Brothers. <laughs> yes. That, we call that press A. It depends on how fast you can press it. You know, that's how that's who wins. <laughs> right, press A. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And that's what I called my fighter name, press A, but all one word. So it was like you know, press A. Press that, a. That's back to like Commodore sixty four days where you played like. California games and you put the pencil across oh your knuckles God. and went back and forth to press A and B really fast as you ran. Right. With the Olympic games? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Use the pencil to make it go faster. Yeah, that's a flashback to California games. Wow. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, speaking of showing our age, <laughs> um, so you guys, you guys know I graduated in the recession <laughs> and um, Peter was actually the first person in the BIM world that I had ever met. I took an internship at HOK that we talked about in one of the last webinars. And Peter was a consultant there through Microdesk. And I became, I tried to become his best friend because he was, like he said, he was the the Revit problem solver and just the superhero that came into the office every once in a while. I think it was every two weeks at that time. And he would just come in and people would have their list of questions. And he would, you know, it it was just so cool to see. And I, you know, wasn't able to keep that internship, unfortunately. So I contacted Peter and I was like, hey, Peter, I need a job and I love Revit. <laughs> Help. And, and Peter kind of took me under his wing. So I owe a lot to Peter and I've known him for, I mean, goodness, wow. 20, 20 years now or 10 years now, right? It was 2010 when I, when I graduated. And um, yeah, he's, he's, like he said, he just can get into the, the offices and figure it out and that was that was so inspiring to me it was always a pleasure working with you and hok was always a trip to, i would go there every other week and i loved it because i never knew what i was walking into and that that was always fun to me i liked walking into places where people were going to throw stuff that i didn't have a chance to prep for because it <clears> forced <throat> me to stay sharp it made sure that i was not laxing or you know just sitting on my laurels with what knowledge I already have and expecting that to keep carrying me forward. You have to keep moving forward. You have to keep learning and be open for whatever that comes. And, you know, I never knew what was going on there, especially because mm-hmm. your office, you had a mixture of people. Like I could be getting, you know, I'd He's show amazing. up in the morning and Trayvon, I loved working with him. Like, hey, I need you to teach something to the landscape crew. Also, we got this weird problem on the in- interiors, guys. And then we're dealing with a structural engineer. And we have to do this for that one project. It's like, all right, cool. You know, I, I never knew it was happening and it, it was fun. That Absolutely. Way. And, you know, it wasn't like you said, he would come in and it would be such random things. It would be massing or curtain walls or, you know, adaptive components. And in 2010, I'm sure you guys remember, it wasn't the, <laughs> yeah, or, or Outlook, or right? Outlook. Like whatever you needed <laughs> to help with. And it was, it was so cool to just kind of be that person that, you know, would just go around and help people, you know, as we have all kind of become familiar to. But I would say that, you know, for the young people who are trying to get more into BIM, you know, I, I would definitely encourage them to kind of do what I did. I, you know, I didn't intentionally know that I would wind up being where I am now, but, you know, I love it in my office. I, I'm assu- assuming that you guys probably feel the same way when somebody gets into your office, especially a new hire or something, someone young, and they just are like, oh my gosh, Dynamo, I want to learn Dynamo. Or, you know, they, they want to, you know, really press the the limits with the the technology and I just I get so excited I'm like oh my gosh somebody that I can teach and somebody I can take ten under my wing you know and so I would definitely say you know definitely mm-hmm. press yep. the limits talk to your BIM people get them more engaged that you know you want to be engaged and you know I think that would definitely pay off especially in today's climate yeah it's always fun to work with somebody who actually wants to learn and that was the great thing with you is that you you knew what you were getting into with you know, the work that I do. It's like, you knew that you travel, you Absolutely. knew you do this, and you were looking forward to that. So it was really easy to, to, to recommend. And, and how say, much you yeah, learn in those roles, right? I mean, going into different offices and seeing their problems, seeing their templates, you know, <laughs> seeing, seeing how they work. 
I used to joke that I, my resume shows me working on all these different projects without having to quit. <laughs> exactly. in six so, you know, you, you get a much quicker and varied uh, outlook on the industry and workflows and what different people need way more than you would ever in any firm. You know, I, I, I'd worked at firms that were as small as me, my boss and his wife to firms like Kling Linquist, where we had 500 people in one building. And I got a lot of varied information and understanding of different kinds of architecture from those companies. Honestly, Kling was probably one of the best for me because that was the first firm I worked at that was multidisciplinary. You know, if you had a problem with the structure or you needed to talk to them, you went down two floors. If you have questions about the MEP or the fire protection, go to the third floor. And it kind of started showing me what the, the industry should be rather than, you know, everybody fighting against or, you know, holding their little fiefdom where it's like, no, we're not going to do that because you're on the other team. It's like, well, we're trying to build a building. You know, we're trying to do something together. What do you need from me? And I'll try to help you and you're going to help me. And that was really good for me as a, a younger developing architect. Yeah. That's the environment that I have today at LPA. Awesome. Which is awesome. Mm-hmm. It's very as well awesome. As I at Smith Group. And even if you don't know the right person, they'll point you in the right direction to find the right person. Yep. It's really cool. It's like, I might not have the answer, but I can point you to who does. That's right. So how are things now, um, Peter? Are you, I, obviously, I'm assuming you're not traveling. How? Um... <laughs> <laughs> so going to different offices is different. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the it, it was a little weird at first because my office that I work from home and I'm, I'm used to working from home and remotely connecting and doing all that. I had been doing it for a while. It was just doing it constantly was the weird thing. You know, I enjoyed getting out of the house here and there. And I, I actually did come to realize I really do miss the travel. I didn't think I would, but I actually do. Mm-hmm. But I miss the travel too. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you, the stuff you take for granted until you don't have it. Like right. a lot exactly. of it. Yeah. Before March, I was traveling to Irvine once a week. Every Wednesday, every oh. Wednesday, and then it switched to every Tuesday. Yeah, I haven't been to Irvine in probably two years now. Yeah, I miss the, I miss that. I miss the getting out and and getting our clients up to speed with that because a lot of them, you know, if if nothing else, this is getting the industry and the world in some respects used to the idea of you can work from anywhere if you have the right mindset and you have the right setup. Uh, I'm kind of laughing in some respects about the whole thing with Yahoo. If you remember a few years ago, there was a new person to take over. And they're like, if you are working from home and you decide to stay that way, you're not going to work here. Mm-hmm. It's like, yeah, how's that working <laughs> out for you now? Especially so in a company like the, Yahoo, right? The technology right? is there. Sheesh. Exactly, yeah. It's like, you're a web company. <laughs> Come on, right. you should be leading this. When I think Google, when all of this happened, they were the first people to start giving people stipends for their home office and you know, things like that. So, I mean, you know, not everybody has the home office set up with the double monitors and, you know, a situation where you're going to sit there for 10 to however many hours a day, right? Most people had a work set up from home that was fine for here and there, but for permanent, you know, they they need like an extra monitor. And and we actually started helping out a lot of people where we would ship them another monitor or somebody needed a headset. So we made sure that, you know, most of the techs were good because a lot of them were gamers or other stuff. So I, I I know I have like a command center practically at this point with the amount of crap that I've got, but we made sure that everybody was situated right with the tech that they needed. And a lot of what we did in the very beginning, I, I was busier than I had been previously b- before everything went hit with the shutdown, because now we were trying to get all of our clients at the same time comfortable or at least up and running remote, whether that meant, you know, using something like BIM 360 or setting things up for VPN or, you know, what have you, just making sure that everybody was able to keep running it as po- good as they could. So it, it's been an interesting, Jesus, uh, eight right. months. <laughs> and, come, and growing, right? But, <laughs> and counting. Yeah, and, and, and counting. Yeah. We're seeing some people go back to work. Uh, talking to our crew in the UK, they are, the, the regulations there changed. I think the last thing was you're not allowed to have groups more than, I want to say it's like six or 15 people. It, I think it's something like six. But more of the companies over there are trying to pull people back into the office than I'm seeing over here. Uh, over here, it's definitely more of a catch as you can. Are you seeing trends one way or the other with uh, cloud versus the VPN circumstances? I mean, I know BIM 360 has, has definitely helped Smith Group a lot in the way that we're working. And we've tried to steer away from VPN, if nothing else, because of the degraded connections and things like that. Yeah, honestly, it's that. And if they're not going with BIM 360, a lot of them are going with different tools like Misuni or Panzura or something where 
where they own the cloud or they've set the cloud up as opposed to with an outside service where you know they're paying and they don't actually have the servers themselves like a bim 360 so but i'm seeing more unless they're a smaller firm where they're just comfortable with the vpn most people are looking at something other than that it's like i the only time i'm on a vpn is if i need to access something old on our network that we're in the process of archiving or cleaning up you know everything else is on you know office 365 or bim 360 or you know some other service that i can access from anywhere right that's something that we've at Smith Group, definitely been migrating a lot towards is especially our internal resources, you know, our BIM guidelines, you know, those types of things of getting them off of a VPN required network to, you know, something that they can connect even on their phones, right? So definitely, you know, been, been a serious change in, in just the day to day, even just starting a new Revit project, right? I mean, the templates aren't really accessible anymore. So, you know, using Unified or some other system to, to get those that content down to people. It's, it's been really interesting. And then of course you think about um, the stuff that you don't really consider that much, like the keynote files and the share, shared parameter files and those types of things. And you start to really wonder like, where, where does all of this stuff want to live, <laughs> right? kind of yeah. being forced into it. It's like, why am I not able to <laughs> yeah, Exactly. <laughs> and then everybody, mo most clients have a couple of different tools that they're working with. Uh, the typical one is Office 365. And then we're looking at, okay, well, you know, do you have Dropbox? Do you have OneDrive? Do you have Box? Uh, BIM 360. Some people are still looking at the old A360. And at this point, if they were doing that, hopefully they downloaded their stuff because that old drive is dead. You know, you've got all these different things that you're trying to work off of and figuring out how to keep them somewhat consistent, you know, and then you're looking at using, uh, as Flow got renamed to Power Apps. You've got the If This Then That. You've got the Workato, ACC Connect, you know, using different tools or writing custom code to keep things somewhat synced or to automate certain mm -hmm. workflows. You know, kind of like you would do it with Dynamo inside of an application. Now we're looking, how do we do more things on the outside of it with a similar approach to creating a script or a rules. What about in terms of technology? Where are you seeing some some shift? I mean, obviously I know, especially in the group, we've tried to put most of our focus on, you know, getting people to work day to day in a smooth way. But in terms of technology and, and where BIM is going, um, I mean, obviously we see a lot of AR, VR, you know, it's definitely a huge thing that, you know, we've in the BIM world noticed for a long time, but I think in terms of consumerism it's becoming much more you know accessible right um you know 3d printers yes and no. definitely yes on that uh the the reason i say yes and no on the ar vr and i love it i've got a vibe downstairs and i've been playing around with it for a while and we actually just became a partner with uh excuse me unity so we're, we're playing around with that some more now too but in terms of okay i'm going to hand you the vr headset right now having somebody take something from someone else and put it on Absolutely. their face that's kind of right. not around so I, I would say that's kind of on hold for a bit but even you can still and use like I the was cardboards with where... your phone <laughs> exactly right. and that's the one that's around I, I read something earlier this week where google's what is it project dream the not the cardboard one but the one that you can buy as mm -hmm. like a plastic still very set. inexpensive and that's that's basically dead inexpensive but they're not continuing oh, wow. to develop it so it's coming down really to, you know, the Facebook option where you have to log in or the HTC slash Valve option, which is more expensive and powerful. So I, because I, I know Microsoft, their versions that they had out for their mixed reality, which wasn't mixed, um, the, which I hated just from the, the branding, which confused things. Uh, that's no longer being developed or at least sold as that. They don't have a, a second version of that. So it's, I'm curious to see where things go in the next couple of years. If AR can really come out, Apple's supposed to have something out in the next year or two. If it can be used, if it can come out and not be a privacy problem, which I know is something that happened early on with the, the Google Glass, the first release of that, that went to like, you know, the uh, the public, then I think it can really transform things way more than VR can. You know, having a heads-up display, being able to work on a car or HVAC system, you have both your hands to actually do work, but you're getting live data whether that data is telling you what's happening with the mechanics or it's telling you what you should do to fix it or you're having a guided workflow from someone else. You know, it, it could be similar to what we do right now for certain tech support. Rather than doing a screen share, 
I can actually see what they're seeing and then guide them through that way. You know, click on the screen and give an arrow and say, no, no, you want to click here. And it's like an overhead uh, display. You know, I, I think we're still a couple of years away from that. Uh, some of the prototype stuff that I've seen is pretty neat. The Google Glass that got rebranded, or not rebranded, released, re-released for the uh, manufacturing side of things and in industrial. That actually looks pretty useful, and it's been successful there. You know, I kind of think that's where they should have went first, as, a prior, as opposed to trying to go for the public, because it's you know it's a geek tool. You're not going to get mass market appeal out of wearing that on your face. You know, it's too too expensive and too weird for I think the mass market to accept right now. Especially with Google branding. <laughs> if Apple came out with it. Oh, story. sad. <laughs> um, I feel like that was the same way with when the Bluetooth headsets came out, right? Like you're looking at people like, are they talking to themselves? You know, just like walking in through the grocery mm -hmm. store or whatever. It was, it was very strange at first, right? And of course now it's become, you know, you see people. It's weird oh, to God, see them. There was a, a comedian. Uh, the comedian had a great bit on that once. It's like, I couldn't tell if someone's talking on a Bluetooth headset or if they're an old couple having an argument 20 <laughs> feet apart. <laughs> that's, that's, you bring up some good topics there. And the, the idea of the heads up display, um, I think sometimes, or, or a lot of times, that kind of gets lost in the noise of, you know, virtual reality, mixed reality, extended reality, augmented reality. Mm -hmm. um, but there's been a lot of devices out there that, take advantage of just, and I'm doing air quotes here, simple heads up display that they've been using, like the XR headsets that they use in the construction field that mm -hmm. snaps onto your, mm -hmm. your hard hat, where they're able to see the information that they need. Uh, perhaps they can't do all the things that we can do in AR, but they have access to that constant stream of data. Uh, you clearly know the person's not recording you or doing anything sort of silly like that because you can see the device. It's big enough to understand what's going on. Um, and there's been so much benefit to those devices but i i feel as you know kind of you mentioned because of the bad publicity and rap that the google glass first got that we're kind of not playing up the potential of that aspect sure the ar will be great when it gets there but i think we should have more more use for that heads-up display and sort of embrace it more than you know be worried that we have this big clunky thing in our heads i mean nobody wanted to wear masks either but after a week everybody's kind of used to it so i think the same yep. thing could happen uh, once we get there, it's just those first few people that, that power through the, the weird looks and the funny stares. Um, and then if it becomes a real useful tool, people will get it. They'll yeah, understand it and move forward. A big aspect of that's going to be safety. You know, I, I don't have to try to look at a drawing or hold something. And if you've already got a device that is giving you a screen, more than likely it's going to have some kind of internet connectivity. And, you know, you can talk about like the, the Wi-Fi 6 or the, um, uh, the oh, I've got it. The something five, which, oh, geez, the phone setup five. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the weekend, I lost my words for the week. <laughs> yep. But the, the next version of that, you can connect to different things and you can triangulate people. And if you're on a job site, whether it's from a security standpoint or just making sure that you know where everyone is. So if you're doing blasting or if something's going down, you have sensors that can detect uh, different gases that humans might not be able to smell, but are still problematic. All that can be built into those things just to make sure that the team is actually safer. And if you have devices that are actually making your job site safer, that could actually help on the back end in terms of insurance. So those kind of things might actually help pay for themselves. You know, if you've got technology that you know avoids two or three change orders and it's paid for itself, something like this could follow the same suit. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that's... Uh that's a way that we will start to go. And I think we've kind of got that, that push that we're now all starting to realize that, you know, technology can do a lot of things that we, we didn't know it could do. And even though we thought it could, we were waiting for that perfect time to test it. Um, and I think we all sort of know that there's never the perfect time. So you kind of jump in and mm -hmm. we're seeing what we have now is all the talks about moving away from VPN and older technology, moving into things like uh, CDEs and that type of environment. This is the same sort of thing. And eventually they will come to the aspects where they're kind of all melted together and they're a device that we're common to and we no longer have laptops and we're typing in the air and all sorts of things. But um, I, I still think that's probably a ways away before we get there, but we need to walk before we can run. In terms of where things are presently, I mean, I'm definitely seeing teams utilize, you know, technology like Enscape and even some of the Revit built-in rendering tools and things like that just for coordination, you know, design, different things like that. I know within Smith Group, we actually have a project team 
uh, we're lucky enough that everybody was able to get a VR, um, you know, I, I believe it was an Oculus, um, and so that we could, you know, coordinate in that way, have, you know, collaborative sessions within VR, um, and, you know, different things. I know Iris, um, you know, a lot of different companies are going to that way, the wild, right, um, where you can have multiple people mm -hmm. in a VR atmosphere, you know, communicating in a way, you know, you can see silhouettes or, you know, the other person in, you know, avatar or whatever it might be within the software where you're actually all, you know, experiencing it together. And I think that's definitely something that we're seeing today. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of the stuff that we've done in terms of BIM, we kind of pulled from manufacturing and a lot of the stuff that we're doing from visualization, we're just pulling from video Absolutely. games. You know, the, 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 we're, we're basically getting closer to an MMO for construction. Bill, you must have something to say. Our, our, our friend Bill is having technical oh, difficulties. Oh, I see that. So, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, he's, he's, he's in the background. He's he, here with us in spirit, and he's definitely recording on the back end. But uh, his, uh, his Zencaster has got laryngitis, we'll say. So, Peter, what other type of technologies do you see coming out and being really kind of general, that, you know, day-to-day -day things that we're seeing regularly? You mentioned 3D printing. Uh, yeah, 3D printing is cool. <laughs> Sorry, uh, 3D printing. I'm not seeing a lot of people really take advantage of it. And it's kind of sad because I really do like it. The most of the time I'm seeing it, it's for either teams that are doing things that are interesting that are, require prototyping. So if you're doing something using like Rhino and Grasshopper or Revit and Dynamo, where you're coming up with interesting forms or shapes, and especially if they're a form that needs to move, you know, like maybe I'm making a uh, facade that is going to be responsive to environmental conditions. Like when the sun is in a certain position, I want it to change. Or if it's raining, I want it to move to either offer protection or to offer collection. You know, things like that you want to play around with and you want to see that it actually works. It, I'm seeing firms that do that kind of work, utilize it. But most other companies that are doing, I don't want to say traditional, like it's a bad thing, but traditional architecture that they're using it more from a marketing standpoint. Like uh, we need to have a model that we can show the client to get sign off. You know, they, they still like something they want to, that's tactile. You know, a rendering's nice, but they want to touch something. And that's fine. But I, I think like a lot of things like generative design and the 3D printing is coming more from the manufacturing side where they actually have to do the prototypes. The architecture firms that are pulling the benefits and the workflows from manufacturing are benefiting more from that tech. Uh, we were actually talking before we started about uh, one of the the, uh, the fluid ones as opposed to filament, and I hadn't been keeping an eye on it, and I was surprised at how cheap it had actually gotten. You know, there's definitely an easy method to get into it. Uh, you've got Fusion 360, which I know I've been reading Autodesk made some changes to, but they updated those changes so you can still use the free version to create the files for the uh, 3D printers. So there's a lot of ways to get in there, uh, and there's a lot of things you can do with it. I'm just not seeing the adoption, like I kind of hoped it would hit. You know, the, I mean, the price keeps getting cheaper. Uh, we were talking about going to the Maker Fair earlier. I always see a lot of different things that are available there. The one year they actually had a fluid-based uh, or resin-based printer that would sit on your phone and use the light from the actual screen to create the different layers. So there's definitely still more and more uh, growth in that industry. But I'm not seeing a whole lot of adoption from architecture firms uh, at least not at the moment. Yeah, speaking of that, I actually was watching a mechanic show with my dad, some garage show, you know, on Discovery or something. And they were actually 3D printing a part for the car and utilizing Fusion. And I was like, oh my gosh, dad, I know what, and then what they're doing. <laughs> you know, and of course I know very, very little when it comes to cars. So being able to talk to my dad about something is pretty cool. Yeah, that was one of the things I loved about, um, I got Jay Leno's garage. Like he'd have cars that are from, you know, an error where you can't get parts now. And they would either scan the part that was on it and then make the 3D model and then print out either a resin prototype for a mold, or they would use the, the 3D sintering for the metal parts and actually recreate something that, you know, doesn't exist. Uh, Bill, I heard you talking in the background. Did you have a question? My uh, thing was, is, is I didn't realize how inexpensive it was to print and how easy it was to print until I actually did it. I think that's probably the barrier to entry is people don't realize how easy it is and how inexpensive it really is to print. Yeah, it's it's crazy how cheap things have gotten. And especially I didn't realize the resin one that that was in like the $200 range to get into that. The yeah. last time I was looking, it was still in the thousands of dollars. 
So what else are you seeing, Pierre, in terms of, um, you know, different firms and, and how they're adapting to the, the new normal, if we will? I'm seeing more <laughs> the, the, work, the tools that allow you to work remotely, uh, definitely. Uh, webcams are finally starting to get a little bit more uh, available, so people are starting to use that. And I've seen some people use it where they've got multiple ones. You've got the one that's on the laptop, and I'll have another one off to the side, so that way if they're drawing or sketching something, they can show that without having to try to figure out, you know, I'm holding it up in front of the laptop. Can you see it now? It's like, no, and more to the right. No, no, the other right. You know, doing that kind of thing to try to, to show that. Or you using different terms like, uh, I think it's movie or movie, uh, different collaboration platforms that I'm not, when I say collaboration platform, I'm not talking like a BIM 360 where we're sharing our models and files. I'm talking something that's more along the lines of like a Teams or Slack or something where we can do mind maps and sketching and really collaborate on an idea before there's anything really to to grow from that. Uh, people yeah. are finding ways to kind of simulate that whole sitting around the desk uh, process. Absolutely. And and you were mentioning about the idea of the people having, you know, their laptop camera and then, you know, a secondary camera. And I'm finding that now when you when you purchase you know, webcams for, and they've come way down on price, but my particular laptop has the, the, I call the up the nose camera. So for whatever reason, the camera's at the bottom of the screen instead of yep. the top. Yeah, um, you get the knuckle view. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I purchased just a, um, a Logitech, you know, HD, nothing special webcam does the job, set it on top, but it came with its own software that allows you to have like multiple screens and control four cameras at once. And it does editing and, and all that stuff. And it was, it was, free software that came with it and it's you know user friendly so it there's really going after that youtube generation i think it is that that can add okay. all these videos and put them all together and you know slice and dice um, and it really does make for a more uh, coherent experience um, it doesn't look like we're sitting in in the basement with a, an old vhs recorder trying to, to get things across and as it becomes more consumer more consumer facing uh, I guess not facing, but you know they're they're able to enjoy what the content, not like us hardcore geeks that don't care what what format it comes in. We just want the information. Uh, yep. It's going to get better and better, and I think then people will adopt it. And as we were talking earlier, the dealing with the the pandemic and having people sort of forced into taking Zoom meetings, everybody's sort of getting used to that. Even though, as we also talked uh, earlier in the pre-show, it still seems people move the mute button all the time it's never in the same place uh you know can't find what's going on there's always those entertaining things that happen with those meetings even though we've done it a thousand times already now we still uh, have those little blunders which are great entertainment for those of us that are not yeah. missing the mute button yeah but the best is if the camera's being shared so you can see the mouth moving and you're like oh dear here we go <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, or the random spouses come into the picture, or the cats, or the the children. Oh, I'm or... totally the cat guy. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll be sitting here. there trying to have a have a meeting, and suddenly there's a tail in front of me. It's like, oh man, really? <laughs> well, and it's so different. You, you, if you have a dog, they they understand. They they'll lie at your feet. You know, they're different. But a cat, it's like as soon as as soon as you're not paying attention to me and you're doing something else, I'm gonna get you. Mm -hmm. Tail comes in the way. Yeah, that's that's just <laughs> how they are. Oh yeah. Like, I still think one of my cats could probably do a Revit demo still. So they've seen enough of it. <laughs> I'm, su I'm surprised that's not a YouTube channel yet. <laughs> Posse does Revit, you know. Boots and the Revit tears. For, for like a, a, a jokey kind of presentation I did once, I actually did a BIM 360 uh, field and glued like PowerPoint with my cats in it. It was like, you know, a field issue was my cat looking at the food bowl it's saying it's empty. It's like, this is the issue. Nice. You, you got to play to the audience. I did a, a built uh, presentation on the Internet of Things, and uh, halfway through it, I stopped. I handed everyone in the audience candy, and we watched three minutes of YouTube videos on cats. As part of <laughs> it's like a way to, to break up the presentation. Um, that is so, you awesome. Know, you, you, do, you just got to play to the audience. Did you get an award that year? Uh, you should have. I didn't get an award, but I did, I did get lots of comments uh, about that. In fact, Bill, Bill was in that class, so um, they they liked he liked the warhead candy, really really spicy and sour. But, uh, um, it's you, you know you're doing a, an hour and uh, what is it seventy five minutes, so an hour and fifteen minutes of of content on something like the Internet of Things. It's not the uh, the most exciting content for everybody, so you gotta stop it and give them a little bit of cat videos. Mm -hmm. I always like the ones where it's like, okay, now everyone's going to get up and stretch. It's like, wait, really? 
I've got my laptop here. What am I going to do? <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, we're, we're coming up. We've passed our Aubin. I, I think this is a, a good point to uh, to to bring this in. So, uh, Dana, I'm going to give last thoughts to you in honor of uh, our technically challenged bill. So uh, why don't you bring us home, Dana? I will say thank you so much, Peter, for joining us today. I always enjoy a conversation with you, of course. And um, hopefully we can get together at a conference, all of us. I, see, I feel like that's how we end most of these things, is saying that we miss each other so much and we can't wait to see each other again, uh, whether that's virtually or, or not. But, um, you know, hopefully we can get, the, get together sometime. And once again, to everybody at home, keep embracing the technology, speak to your BIM people, you know, stay engaged, stay on top of that new technology. Thank you again for listening today. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure.